How many of you have heard anything about the flooding going on in Kenya? A few of you have, okay? <clears throat> it hasn't been, I haven't seen it on any of the news broadcasts that I've been listening to, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been on there. But uh, for those who aren't aware, we have more of our tribe, the Quakers, the Qu uh, friends in Kenya, than we do all the rest of the world combined. Uh, they say if you throw a stone and especially the western part of Kenya, you'll hit a Quaker. Uh, but uh, they've had terrible flooding over the last few weeks, and uh, the news, is, has, as far as I'm concerned, has not covered it adequately. Over 300 have been killed, and uh, many of the uh, roads have been washed away and destroyed crops, uh, and the whole uh, sensitive nature of that economy and that, uh, that whole uh, agricultural system and everything has, has been put at, put at great risk. Uh, and one of the interesting things I saw when I did some research is with the flooding uh, the, and a lot of the uh, forested areas have been cut down and those that are remained have been affected by the rains. The, the snakes are seeking higher ground. And so a lot of the poisonous snakes are coming to where people are. And there's been more, po more snake bites from the flood that are just off the charts. And they don't have the antidotes available because the roads are washed out. So it's just a massive complication of problems. And uh, the food prices, which were already high, are now soaring, and hunger and starvation is, is there. They, as I mentioned, they closed schools, and, and I imagine a lot of the friends are meeting wherever they can meet on this Sabbath. So uh, we need to remember our friends in Kenya, and that's our emphasis for our July quarter, or June, rather, June quarter two if you'd remember to put that in your quarters in the tube, but also any checks or cash would be appreciated. Let's just pause a moment and pray for Kenya. Father, as we uh, celebrate uh, our brothers and sisters, as we rejoice with them and their rapid growth and the way the kingdom of God has spread, uh, not just in Kenya, but in surrounding countries there, we, we grieve with them today. And we ask that you would minister in unusual ways uh, that only your spirit can empower people to do, uh, where people have lost their livelihood, lost uh, loved ones, uh, so much at loss. We pray that you would comfort them. Help us to know what we can do as brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. I might just add to what Tom has said I visited with Lloyd, and the flooding is not in the area of where we have the farm, the FUM farm over there. Um, the farm ground is still above floodwaters, um, and that is something to thank the Lord for. I, I don't know, is it 800 acres they have? So, and they, they are depending on that to, to help finance the Kenyan meeting um, over there. So praise the Lord for that. I want you to notice today, um, I did um, choose some, some songs that are actually in our hymn book. Um, Daniel and I uh, talked about it, and he says, yeah, these are great. And I said, okay, we'll sing them then. And you know the neat thing about it Underneath the, and you can read them, if, if you don't want to open the book, it's fine. The, the lyrics will be in front of you, so that will be. But underneath the, the title of the song, there's a verse. And I thought, oh, yes, Lord, these are verses that we need to look at to put within our heart as we bring our worship to you. They are, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. What a wonderful, wonderful verse. And then our God reigns. How beautiful are the feet. That's all of us. We all have feet, right? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Why shouldn't we bring worship to him this morning? And then, when I look into your holiness, this is what I seek. 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I pray that we can do that with our hearts and our voices today. So these songs we're singing this morning may be <clears throat> unfamiliar to some of you, but like Marlene said, the words will be here, or you can use your hymnal. <clears throat> if you don't know them, some of you are helped when there's music to follow, so do that if that's helpful. Uh, the first one, we bring the sacrifice of praise. Some of you know that there are motions to this song that we learned at camp, so... Um, if you know the songs, sing out, and if you know the motions, well, they're not hard, so just, just do what I do. So let's, let's stand as we bring the sacrifice of praise. Marlene, could we pick it up just a little bit? Speed it up. Just a little bit, yeah. Second time through. You're using the hymnals, number 272, and we'll go right into the next one when we're done with those verses.
number 649 if you're using the hymnals. One, one time through. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. About to throw that off the stage here. Well, it's good to be with you. For those that don't know me, my name is Manny Garcia, and I have the privilege of serving as the general superintendent for Iowa Yearly Meeting of Friends, which this church is part of community of uh, 28 ministry points, 27 churches, and our Meskwaki mission near Tama. Um, but this is where our family calls home. We live just a few blocks from here and worship here and when I'm not on the road. So it's good to be able to share um, this morning and for the next several weeks. Um, I'm going to be sharing a series that I've titled The More Better Life. Um, you can see it's kind of a callback to maybe 1950s. Um, that was the era of Lots of advertisement and innovation, uh, post-war 1950s. Um, we saw a lot of inventions during that time. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with all of the things that the 50s afforded us, but um, things like the dishwasher, right? Saran wrap, cover up your leftovers and keep them airtight. Microwave ovens were invented in the 1950s. Does anybody know how much the first microwave oven retailed for? Any guesses? It was, average was $1,300. Now remember, that was in 1950, so I put it into a little formula that adjusts for inflation, and today that same microwave would cost you $17,000. So probably the, the haves more than the haves not have not uh, used the microwave. Um, other things, pre-sliced cheese came onto the grocery store shelves in 1915. In 1952, Bird's Eye started selling frozen vegetables and introduced us to the fish stick. So thanks to Bird's Eye for that, I think. Uh, Swanson rolled out the first TV dinners in 1953, so you could put your newly uh, your, your TV dinner into your $1,300 microwave and then sit in front of your television and watch uh, whatever show you enjoyed back then. Uh, Magic Chef gave us the gas oven in 1954, and in their advertisement, it promised to save women time because they could put the food in and then go do something else. 
and then come back to a perfectly cooked meal. Other inventions that the 50s gave us, automatic doors, minute rice, the color television, TV remote controls, cake mix, power steering, frozen waffles, canned tuna, instant tea, and McDonald's. This more, better life, at least in the area of the 50s, was about convenience. It was about comfort. It was about innovation. And I would argue that not much has changed some 70 years later. We are still chasing after this good life, this easy life maybe, this enjoyable life, the more, better life. But is our search really focused in the right areas as we pursue This kind of life that's promised to us through advertisements. Is our smartphone addicted, binge watching, door dashing, grocery store pickup, Amazon Prime, two day shipping, podcast life, really the more better life? Hmm. The world tells us it is. The world says, do what feels good. And Jesus says, do what I've commanded. The world says, follow your heart. But Jesus says, follow me. The world says, believe in your dreams. Jesus says, believe in me. The world says, go out and discover yourself. And Jesus says, deny yourself. The world says, hey, you do you. Whatever's right for you, you just go do that. And Jesus says, do as I have done. The more better life for a follower of Christ is and should be drastically different from what we're seeing in the world. Our goal as Christians, as followers of Christ, shouldn't be convenience or comfort, nor is it having things our way, figuring out what we want most and then pursuing it. The goal of the Christian life is to live in such a way that it communicates the rule and reign of Christ and reveals his kingdom more fully to those around us. It's about the upside-down kingdom of God that values sacrificial love, generosity, community, forgiveness, equality, mutuality, and maturity. The more better life is about the redemption of what God created in the beginning. Remember, God took six days to create, and at the end of those days, he said, it's, it's very good. It's very good. It's shalom. All things are working together the way I created them. And the more better life is about pursuing and enacting that shalom in our areas of influence. In John 10.10, Jesus says that the thief, the enemy, comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life to the full. And in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, which inspired the name of this series, it says, a thief is only here to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. And isn't that what the 50s promised us? More and better than you ever dreamed of. And in a lot of ways, the world's still promising us that. You can have more. It can be better Do what what you want. Chase your dreams. In the 1950s, we saw the beginning of the age of making your dreams come true. And don't mishear what I'm saying, because a lot of those inventions and innovations of that era and of this one are good. We appreciate them. We enjoy them. They free us up to do other things. They're not inherently evil. But we have to keep in mind that the world that we live in And the life that we choose to pursue is complex and nuanced. The decisions that we make, the things that we value, the goals that we chase after and pursue are not benign. The things that we do shape us. The decisions that we make form us and make us who we are becoming. Sometimes convincing us to pursue things like convenience or comfort is the easiest way for the enemy to keep us from realizing that more better life. Because if you go back to that verse, the enemy's not here to make your life hard. He's here to destroy you. 
A friend of mine used to say, you know, Satan's best trick is not making your life difficult. It's not making things hard for you. It's actually, he just wants to kill you. He wants to separate you from God. He doesn't play by the same rules that we do. He is a by any means necessary enemy. And if it means making your life easy or convincing you to chase what feels good, that's what he'll do. He's not here to make your life hard. He's here to kill you. So the goal of this series, The More Better Life, is to help us refocus in a few areas of our lives. It's not exhaustive, but a few areas that will help us pursue this life that Christ promises us in John 10.10. Eternal life, real life, more and better life. So we're going to look at several topics. We're going to look at things like community, hospitality, worship. But today we're going to get into a topic that makes some people a little bit uncomfortable. We get a little anxious when we talk about this kind of thing, but we're going to talk about generosity. Money, yes, but also time, our resources. Talking about this kind of makes us nervous sometimes. It shouldn't, but it does. I think we get nervous because on some level, we give from what's left, right? At the end of my day, at the end of my work week, if I have a couple of hours left to spare, maybe, just maybe, I'll volunteer. I'll give my time. After all my bills are paid, and I've put some money away in the retirement fund and a little bit away for vacation, and maybe I got that new pair of shoes that I wanted. If there's anything left, maybe, just maybe, I have a few dollars to spare. Some of you don't operate that way, and, and great, but this is, this is the new culture we give from what's left. And it's really new, but it's also old, because if you remember all the way back in Genesis 4, this is the first time that we really get a glimpse of how much God appreciates generosity. Cain and Abel, Right? Cain gave a little bit of the fruits of his labor, but Abel gave some of the best fats, some of the first fruits. And God looked on Abel with favor and not so much on Cain. And that started, of course, a little bit of sibling rivalry, which ended in the first murder in Scripture. When we look at our bank accounts, our calendars, I think we can start to see where our priorities lie. As a matter of fact, an older guy in in one of the first churches that I became a member at, he said, you know what, show me your checkbook, and I'll show you what's Lord of your life. And that felt like I was getting punched in the stomach when he said that. But it's true. Show me your calendar, and I'll show you what you value. I think we get nervous about talking about these things because on some level, again, we just give from what's left. We look at our money, we look at our time, and it's hard to hide where our priorities are. Talking just about money, here's where the average American's money goes. 33% of American money goes to housing. And now this was a couple of years ago that this research, I'm sure in today's economy, this is probably a lot higher. 16% on travel, that includes cars, fuel, public transit, etc. 13% on food, probably higher on that one as well. They save about 11%. 8% on healthcare, 6% on entertainment, 4% on miscellaneous expenditures, 3% on clothing, 3% on education, 1% on alcoholic beverages, and 2% on charitable giving. So just this small breakdown reveals, in, by and large, in general, how the American, on average, views generosity. It's not an ingredient in American more better life. I mean, just look at it. 6% on entertainment, 2% on charitable giving. 3% on clothing, 2% on charitable giving. Generosity shouldn't make us nervous. Think about creation. Think about God. Omnipotence. He doesn't need our stuff. God doesn't need our stuff. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need us to accomplish his will on this earth. But he's grafted us into the story. He's invited us to be part of this narrative of the gospel. He doesn't need us, we need him. God has a plan for creation and it's really quite incredible that we get 
to be part of it. All the way back in Genesis, when sin entered the world, God's plan began to unfold. And all along the story, he says, I want you, my my people, the, the crown of my creation, you get to be part of this. You get to participate in the unfolding of the gospel, in the redemption of the world. That should excite us. That should get us our blood pumping. We get to be part of the redemption of creation. This part of the more better life is about the absolute absurdity of generosity. Because it's absurd. In worldly terms, it doesn't make sense. So the text I want to look at today is a little bit unusual when we talk about generosity, but it's the triumphal entry. You know the story. We're only a several weeks removed from Easter, so you, kind of, you probably remember this is when Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. What does that have to do with generosity? Jesus is about to do the greatest thing that ever has been done on this earth. He's about to go to the cross and die and then come back to life. And in doing so, redeem humanity. Restore the created order. Give us a path back to union with the Father. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and once there you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that to untie the donkey and the little donkey. There's two donkeys there. Did you know there were two donkeys in the triumphal entry story? Sometimes we see plays and the kids are dressed up in costumes and there's usually only one donkey. But I want to be biblically accurate this morning. There's two, there were two donkeys. There was an adult donkey and there was a child donkey. A big donkey and a little donkey. Jesus can ask for anything, right? He can ask for anything. He's Jesus. He's Lord. God used, he was, he was the word at creation. He could ask for anything. And he asks for a donkey and a little donkey. If anyone says anything to you, he says, tell them the Lord needs them. Now put yourself in that donkey owner's shoes for just a moment. And and let's even move it up to 2024. I come knocking on your door. I need to borrow your Toyota Camry. The Lord needs it. Are you loaning me that car? Honestly? I mean, this was kind of weird. So this guy has a decision to make. This donkey owner has a decision to make. And Jesus knew the guy was going to have questions, so he prepares them. Hey, listen, the Lord needs your donkey and your little donkey. I wonder if the guy tried to negotiate. You need both of them? How about just one? Can I just give you the little donkey? Because what if I don't get him back, right? Sometimes we do that. We negotiate. Maybe not out loud. Maybe we're not talking out loud with God, but in our hearts, sometimes we try to negotiate with our generosity. Maybe we ask, God, do you want my first fruits? Before I do anything else, you want me to give my time or, or my finances or, or my resources to you, my first fruits? What if I pay a couple of bills first? Just to make sure. The big ones. House, car, you know, after that we can talk. You want me to give my time now at the beginning before I know anything else that's going to happen this week? I mean, what if, what if something incredible happens? What if there's an event that I want to go to? What if I've got friends visiting? I don't, I don't want to tie up my time. How about just a $10 bill in the offering plate this week? How about we see how things stack up after my schedule's set? After I've set aside some time for myself? God, do you want me to serve? You want me to volunteer to help with the children's ministry? You want, you want me to worship with my faith community every Sunday? Man, I'm really busy, God. I've got work, I've got, my kids have practice, my family's in town, and they don't go to church, so it'd be weird if I had them come with me. And I don't want to leave them by themselves. We've got games every Saturday and sometimes on Sunday. You know, it's hunting season, it's fishing season, it's boating season, it's camping season, it's skiing season. 
football season. I'm a little peopled out this week. It's my only day to sleep in. I don't like the music. I don't like the preaching. I don't like the people. I just need a day to myself. We do this. We negotiate. Jesus knows how people are. He knows our hearts. He knew there would be a negotiation, and so he prepares the disciples. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's why there were two. It was a prophecy. And Jesus knew the prophecy. And so he's now fulfilling that promise that was made all those generations ago. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. Pray with me. God, we are grateful for your word that you promise does not return void. And Lord, as we think about this topic of generosity in the kingdom, Lord, I pray that we would have hearts and minds that would be molded and shaped by you, that you would transform us, not conforming to the patterns of this world, but renewing our minds, that we might think with, with kingdom imaginations, and that we might respond with kingdom obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This idea of generosity is really incredible when we start to think about it because God is asking us for something. God is asking you for something. And when we stop and think about it like that, it's a little bit crazy. I might use the word ludicrous. It doesn't make sense. The creator of all things, the Alpha and the Omega, would ask me for anything. It's really mind-blowing. The fact that he has Jesus send his disciples into this town to find and borrow a donkey and a little donkey is absurd. Because he could have just said, hey, my son's coming to town and he's about to do the most important thing that has ever been done in the history of humanity. And the prophet said that he would be riding on a donkey in the cold of a donkey and so, bam, there they are. God can do that. God can just have a donkey and a colt of a donkey appear out of thin air if he wanted to. He's God. He could have said to Jesus and the disciples, look, I made a donkey and a little donkey for you. You're welcome. Carry on. And God can just make whatever else he needs to make if he wants to because he's God. If he wanted to fill the bank account of this church with money, to accomplish the vision that he's given us as a body, he could do that. Michelle, can you check if that just happened? Just wanted, I mean, I don't know. You need to refurbish your building to keep the mission of this church going? No problem. God could snap his fingers and give us what we need. You need to feed hungry families? There you go. Your budget running short? Look again. God can do this kind of stuff. He's God. You need more funds because you want to hire a pastor and maybe you have a vision for a youth pastor, a children's pastor. Great, I got you. He can do whatever he wants because he's God. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, he will accomplish his plan on this earth regardless of what we do. But he's inviting us to be part of it. God's going to get his way in the end. One way or another, victory is secure. But he's asking, would you like to be part of it? Would you like to be on the journey toward victory with me? If you do, it includes generosity. Think about that. 
God, God owns it all, created it all. He created you. It's all his. But he's asking for your generosity. He's asking to borrow from you. I mean, in this context here, God could have done anything, anything. Pulling a donkey out of thin air. But he chooses to send the disciples to a donkey owner and, and say, hey, Jesus would like to borrow your donkey and your little donkey. The fact that God comes to us and asks to borrow things from us, things that he created, is amazing. It's amazing. The psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it is the Lord's. Therefore, when God says to me, I want you to be part of what I'm doing in and through College Avenue Friends Church. I don't get to say, well, wait a minute. You want me to give my, my money? You want me to give my time to this place? Because when you're in a relationship with God, the God of the universe, and don't get me wrong here, I'm not advocating for just giving carelessly, for being frivolous. But when God asks me for something, my response should be, God, are you kidding? You're asking me for some of the money that belongs to you anyway? I mean, the only reason I have money is because you've blessed me with gifts and abilities. You've given me opportunities. You've, you've introduced me to people. I'm only here because of you. Of course. Of course, God. Take what you need. It's yours. And the fact that God comes to us and asks us to borrow something from us that belongs to him anyway, is crazy. Like, when you really think about it, you kind of just want to laugh. It's silly. But it's one of the ways that we get to experience this more, better life. We are invited to co-labor with Christ. That means Christ is at work. He's laboring, and he's saying, hey, come and co-labor. Come and work alongside of me. That's crazy. And his work becomes our work. We get to be part of what he's doing in this place, in this city, in this state, in this country, in the world. We get to be part of it through our generosity. I mean, Tom just talked about an opportunity. There are people in need in Kenya. You get to be part of, you have a choice to be part of the redemption of that story. That's crazy. But we don't think about it like that. We think, well, what, what good's 50 bucks going to do? Somebody else will take care of that. Somebody will write a check. Somebody will fly there and fix it. But the thing of it is, there are in every church, in every organization, there are what you call major donors, right? People that, that write 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 million dollar checks. And we love them. They're great. This church probably has a few, right? Something breaks, psh, got you. Write a check. But God's mission on this earth is not fulfilled through the major donors alone. It's through the average ordinary donkey owner. It is. Because collectively, we are better together than we are alone. Your $5 might, might be a drop in the bucket, but your $5 and another 500 people's $5, that adds up pretty quick. Jesus could have come any way he wanted. Any way he wanted. He could have come in a Tesla Cybertruck. Hadn't even been invented yet. He could have rolled up in a Tesla Cybertruck with a couple of 12-inch subwoofers booming some bass, right? Hopped out of that truck, what's up? I'm the Messiah. He could have come being carried in by angels. That would have been terrifying. He could have come any way he wanted, and he comes on a borrowed donkey and little donkey. He invites collaboration. He invites the owner of these animals to experience the more better life with him. Now this is a whole different message, kind of a side note, but I kind of feel like I need to say it anyway. If Jesus came in on a donkey, I should probably step off my high horse sometimes. 
If my Savior took the posture of humility when he could have come any way he wanted, the posture of submission, maybe I should follow that example. Jesus came lowly, humbly, and simply because that is the nature of the kingdom of God. It's also incredible that Jesus came riding into town on the generosity of ordinary people. And that's the point I want you to hear, maybe more than any this morning. Alone, you might not be able to do anything extraordinary. I don't know about you, but I don't have $50,000 check writing ability. I mean, I could write it, but it's going to bounce higher than a basketball. That's not what God's asking of me. He's not saying, man, look, that other, that other person can give 100000 Where are you at? That's not how God operates. He could, come, he could have come in on the backs of a couple of major donors. That's how some churches get by. He could have won the favor of the uber-rich. There were a lot of rich people back then. And I've seen some ministries operate that way. He could have just done it himself because he's Jesus. God's will is going to be done with or without us, but he's inviting us into it. And in this story, he decides to start the process of doing the greatest thing in the history of humanity by borrowing from someone. Borrowing something that belonged to him anyway. He chose to depend on the generosity of ordinary, normal people like you and me. This is the same way Jesus wants to ride into College Avenue Friends Church, by the way into this neighborhood, into the city of Oskaloosa. He rides in on the generosity of ordinary people like us. Through this church and the mission he's given us, if we are obedient to it. Do we have major givers here? Yes. And we're thankful for them. We would not come close to doing what we do without them. But we also have many faithful people who might be classified as ordinary. Some don't have a lot. Some don't have a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy, right? I visit a lot of churches in my role, and one of the things I hear most, because a lot of churches are, have more experienced adults in them, and one of the words I hear a lot is, we're just very tired. And that's Okay. Usually what my response to that is, do what you can. You might have to do it differently than you did before, but you're not done. God is still inviting you to be part of the story. You don't get to hang up the hat yet. Without ordinary people, without people that that give ordinary money, ordinary time, ordinary resources, we would be stuck unable to move forward, locally as a church, globally as the kingdom. We don't have to be the richest person to make an impact. You don't have to give $100,000. If you want to, that's great. We'll take it, and we'll use it for God's glory. But some of us only have a donkey. Some of you have $100,000 resources, and some of you have donkey resources. And if you only have a donkey... Don't freak out, because it's the ordinary person in the eyes of God that can give extraordinarily to the kingdom. God doesn't simply arrive and appear in communities and cities. He arrives in those places on the generosity of ordinary people. We want to see God thick in this place, thick in Oskaloosa. He arrives on our generosity. Ordinary people. He arrived in this place, in this area, because some people recognized the need. They heard the call and they were generous. We wouldn't have this facility if a group of people so many years ago hadn't seen a need and said, you know what, I can give. I can give a little bit to that. I promise you it wasn't one person that wrote a check for this building. It was a collective effort. It was the generosity of ordinary people. And I just want to be honest with you, this church and its impact won't be nearly what God is calling us to be 
if ordinary people like you and I don't continue to be generous? Do we really have a desire to see the next season of College Avenue Friends have a kingdom impact in Oskaloosa? If the answer to that is yes, we have to be generous. We have to give financially. We have to give with our time. We have to be together and present. We have to operate in the community as agents of change for the kingdom of God. But it just continues to blow my mind that God chooses to depend on the generosity of ordinary people. The Son of God, when He arrives at a place, could arrive in all of the pomp and circumstance and splendor that He wants and deserves. And He chooses to come with us, with our yes, with our obedience, with our surrender. And it says, when He arrived on that donkey and that little donkey, the city was stirred. The city was stirred. Now trace that reaction back to the beginning of the story. A donkey owner, humble, meek, sets off a tidal wave in a city. An ordinary man allowed the Lord to borrow from him, and it starts a series of events that impacts an entire city and eventually the entire world. It starts with the simple yes, from a humble man who owned a couple of donkeys. And we sit here today because of that yes. What will your yes unlock in the kingdom? What will your generosity unlock in the kingdom of God? What will your generosity unlock in the future mission of College Avenue Friends, in the future mission of the Friends Church, in the future mission of the Church Capital C? See, we don't think that our yes is going to have that big of an impact. And a lot of times we don't get to see the end result of that. But we can trust that God is faithful to his promises. It's so incredible that our generosity writes us into the story of God. Our greed writes us out of the story of God, but our generosity writes us into the story of God. There's literally a guy who owned a donkey and a little donkey in the gospel. It's those little acts of responsiveness and of generosity that write us into the gospel. I'm not in the gospel. You're not in the gospel. Maybe we could be if we lived back then, and and, and, in that time we responded to God with what we have and who we are, But it's moments like this, it's those little acts of responsiveness to God's promptings in our lives that write us into the gospel story. There's a lady with two small coins, a widow's mite, and we don't know a lot about her, but she's in the gospel. There's a kid with five loaves and two fishes, basically a lunchable. We don't know much else about him, but he's in the gospel. We know Joseph of Arimathea. Why? Because he loaned Jesus a tomb when Jesus needed a tomb, and he's in the gospel. He didn't need to be in the gospel. He didn't need to be written into the story. This is the resurrection. It's Easter. It's pretty much the greatest thing that's ever happened. And pretty prominently in that story is a guy named Joseph of Arimathea who loaned Jesus a tomb. God did not have to take the time to acknowledge him in the gospel story, but he does. And he does it because the way that God orchestrated his story depends on the generosity of ordinary people. And he invites the people he loves into his unfolding of this epic redemption of creation. God chooses to co-labor with us. We don't get written in because we're important or rich or smart or charismatic. We get written in because we're available and receptive and responsive and we say yes to God. The words in Matthew 21, See your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey, 
were first said by Zechariah in 500 B.C. In 500 B.C., God said, this is what I'm going to do in this city on this day. And all those years later, one man's generosity fulfills God's destiny for that city. And it makes me wonder, what is God's promise to this place? What is God's promise to College Avenue Friends Church? What is God's promise to Oskaloosa? What is God's promise to Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin, where Iowa Yearly Meeting of Friends operate? What about to Cuba, to Belize, to Kenya? What about to broken families? What about to homeless people? What are God's promises to the lost and the least and the last? What are God's promises to parents and to teenagers? What are God's promises to marriages? What are God's promises to hurting people, to sick people, to grieving people, to lonely people? I wonder what God's promises to these people are, and I wonder how we are going to get to be part of of God fulfilling those promises that were spoken long before we existed. God answered these promises long before us, but we get to be part of seeing them be fulfilled if we say yes when God asks us. And we get to be written into the story. I want to tell you a story to close about some people, and I won't say their names because they wouldn't want me to. But they were written into the story of God because they understood the reality that God orchestrates his plan in such a way that it depends on generosity and it depends on ordinary people. When I was in my earliest stages of my walk with God, praying about whether or not God might be calling me into ministry, I was still a baby Christian. And I, and I began to sense that this might be what God had created me to do. And so I started to share that with just a, f- a few people. And I'll tell you, in, in our early marriage, we were broke. Like so broke you couldn't fix it. Married with a couple of kids. Together, I was trying to do the math the other day. We, $18 an hour together might be generous. But when I started to tell people what I thought that God was doing in my life, their eyes lit up. And again, these were not super rich people that could write me a $50,000 check and said, here you go, go get training. They were ordinary people that decided to do something extraordinary. People gave me checks for tuition. One person provided us for a, with a home to live in in Haviland, Kansas while I studied at Berkeley College, and the rent was absolutely absurd, even for that time. And I remember telling him how much we could afford, and he said, I won't take a penny more than this, and it was about half of the number I said. We would have random packages of groceries dropped off on our doorstep or meals provided to us. People surprised us in incredible ways with their generosity. And I give all I give God all the credit for those things, but if these people, these ordinary people, hadn't been faithful and generous with what God was doing, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. I'm sure of that. When you are faithful and generous to what God is doing, he will write you into the story. And the craziest part of it all, the most insane part of this, is that we actually get back more than we give. We're not supposed to talk about that part. We're supposed to be selfless, right? Have these amazing motives. But let's face it, we're flesh and blood. And especially those with the financial mind, they want to know, well, what's the return on investment, right? What's the ROI? The guy got his donkeys back, right? They, they didn't talk about crucifying a donkey in that story. The guy got him back. The Mount of Olives is just over the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem. On a donkey, it probably wouldn't have taken over an hour. I imagine maybe the guy's following along, right? That's my donkey. Jesus is on my donkey, guys. 
gets back home. Babe, you're not going to believe this. Today, Jesus rode in on a donkey and a little donkey, and there were palm branches everywhere, and those were our donkeys. I think there was Chris Tomlin in the background or something. It was crazy. He got the donkeys back. And you're going to get back whatever you give to the story in some way. It might not look the way we expect it to look, but God is going to make sure we have what we need, and he's going to bless us for being obedient. Somehow, some way. Because the economics of the kingdom of God don't line up with the economics of the world. They just don't. I'll tell you one thing. When I say yes to God, I never go hungry. I might have to give up some things that I think I need or or some things that I want, but I survive and I thrive because God is a God of abundance. God is a God that promises us, us a more better life, a full life, an abundant life. And all it requires is our yes. How generous should we be? C.S. Lewis once wrote this. I don't believe one can settle on how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. What's the, what's the cliff note of that? How much should we give more than we think we can? more than we think we can. And that that includes more than our money. It includes your time, it includes your resources, it includes your gifts, your abilities. Give more than you think you can. It should be sacrificial a little bit. We should notice it. But the part that we don't like to talk about because it it seems disingenuous is that when we give away more than we think we can, God blesses us in that. If we want this church, this building, this patch of land to be a beacon of hope, of light for this area, it's going to require generosity. Yes, from those who have big bank accounts, but also maybe more so from those who have little bank accounts. Those ordinary givers who find it sacrificial to give. It cannot depend on one or two people. This story of the future of College Avenue friends and our impact in Oskaloosa will take all of us. It will take our generosity, it will take our time, it will take our effort. The question is, do we want to be part of that story? The more better life is a generous life. It's a rich life. It's an abundant life. Let's pray. God, we are grateful and humbled by your invitation to be written into the story. And Lord, I pray that our response might be like that donkey owner's Maybe a little inquisitive at first. What do you need that for, God? But ultimately, obedient. Ultimately, Lord, saying yes and setting off a series of events that maybe we never get to see the end of. But it it changes and shapes our area of influence. It allows the kingdom of God to be more readily seen and experienced by others around us. Lord, I pray for this church that we would once again be in line with whatever will you have for us in this next season, Lord, that we would have an impact in this this city, in this state. Lord, that that what we do here would matter to the kingdom. And Lord, I believe it all starts with our humble offering our generosity, and that you will multiply it and expand it and use it in ways that we have not yet asked or imagined. And so we thank you in advance, Lord Jesus, for the work that you're going to do in and through us. In your name we pray. Amen.
There's a song I've been listening to uh, quite a bit recently. I think it really ties into this. And I'm hearing it from Johnny Cash and kind of, kind of when you get into the gospel music he has. And the uh, song title is, Would You Recognize Jesus? He begins with a few verses of, If you've never fed the hungry or given clothes to the poor, if you've never helped the stranger who came knocking on your door, if you forgot to send some flowers to sick and shut in friend, well, if you ain't helping none of these, then you ain't helping him. If you've ever watched an old man plowing behind a mule, if you've ever stopped and listened when you could not hear a sound, then brother, you have met him because Jesus gets around. The one really impact or uh, verse he has here. Would you recognize Jesus if you met him face to face? Or would you wonder if he is just another one you could not place?
If you're using your hymnals, it's number 340. dismissed.